Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Sunshine Menezes, the Executive Director of Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island and a Clinical Associate Professor of Environmental Communication here. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this session in our Career Development Program Winter Intensive. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to offer um, just a couple remarks before we get going on this, this session. Um, this program is offered as part of the Rhode Island Consortium for Coastal Ecology Assessment Innovation and Modeling, or Rhode Island CAIM, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. And a major focus of the, the EPSCOR grant that, that supports Rhode Island CAIM is workforce development. And within that context, we developed the Career Development Program to provide um, students and postdocs some additional training and, um, and resources related to career success that are honestly not very often offered formally within your, your studies. So this is an effort to redress some of those gaps. And um, if you haven't already, you can enroll for the Career Development Program Certificate. This is an informal certificate program. Um, and all of the details are listed at this link, metcalfinstitute.org backslash career development. Um, there are only five required programs and you can do three electives. So if you were to attend all of the programs today and tomorrow in this intensive, you would cross off quite a large number of those um, requirements and could get this certificate very quickly. Um, and it's a great thing to put on your CV or your resume. So I encourage you to do that. And if you have any questions, just reach out to us at Metcalf Institute. I also wanna note that we have a series of community agreements as part of our programs. Number one, and across the board, be respectful, of course. Um, we ask that you allow everyone the opportunity to contribute equally to the conversation and that you listen actively. Um, again, respect others when they're talking. Um, always speak from your own experience instead of generalizing. So that's like I statements instead of they, we, or you. And don't invalidate another person's story or experience with your spin on their experience. Share your own stories and your own experiences. Um, also, if you logistics, please mute yourself unless you're speaking. Use the either the raise hand function or insert your questions in the chat. Um, sometimes if the speakers just invite you to jump in with a question, you can do that. And um, it would be great for you to introduce yourself before speaking. If you have not already done so, I'm just taking a quick look. Um, if your name in, in Zoom is shown as like initials or something, please go ahead and type out your full name and your, your pronouns if you'd like, uh, so that we know um, who we're talking with. And also, finally, I just want to note that we are recording the beginning of this session today um, when we hear from our speakers uh, in their introductory remarks, and then we'll stop recording and um, open this up for a broader conversation so you all can ask questions and, and hear their responses. So with that, I will introduce our, our panelists for the day. Um, we have Catalina Martinez who is the Regional Program Manager for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, otherwise known as OER. Um, Catalina began her ocean science career with NOAA in 2002, working on ship operations and logistics, as well as education and outreach initiatives that were associated with the expeditions they run to explore little known and unknown ocean areas. Catalina spent many years sailing on research vessels as the expedition coordinator for NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, and also managing multiple important collaborations and partnerships for the program. She works on a, a wide range of local, regional, and national efforts to help create a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive STEM workforce. She's a, um, a really remarkable leader in that space. And she consistently seeks to increase the potential for life success for those people who were born to challenging circumstances. Uh, recently, Catalina completed a temporary assignment with NOAA's Office of Inclusion and Civil Rights, where she worked to um, expand their diversity, equity, and inclusion portfolio. Welcome, Catalina. Um, we also are pleased to welcome Dr. Zara Minu Madani, 
a research scientist at Kite Pharma, um, a job which she has just moved to. Um, and we're really thrilled that she made time to join us, given the fact that she just moved across the country. Um, after receiving her doctorate in chemical engineering from URI, in fact, a number of you today might might know um, me new personally, she worked as a project manager at gel for med Inc, a regenerative medicine company that's focused on developing materials to address unmet clinical needs in soft tissue regeneration. She can tell you more about what that means. Um, she is just beginning a new position with Kite Pharma, where she's a research scientist in their process development team. In broad terms, she's interested in solving medical challenges by developing novel technologies and bringing innovative technologies from the lab to the clinic. And finally, um, we welcome Dr. Kersey Sturdevant, who is a principal scientist at Inspire Environmental, a consulting firm he helped to establish, where he is involved in strategic planning, business development, project design and implementation, presenting results to external stakeholders and mentoring junior staff. Kersey is also an adjunct assistant professor at Duke University. Um, he received his PhD in marine science um, from the College of William and Mary, where he developed a camera system called WormCam that changed the way scientists view the seafloor. He also previously worked as a research coordinator of NOAA's Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And he started a program called Oceanography for Everyone. You can visit oceanographyforeveryone.com, which is an open source effort to develop low cost oceanographic hardware to make ocean science accessible to everyone. He also published a, a very comprehensive step-by-step -step guide on how to get into graduate school in the sciences with Cambridge University Press. And I'll share that link in the chat in just a moment. So, an incredible panel with um, all kinds of expertise coming from the private sector, academia, and government. And we're really pleased to hear from everyone today. So as I said, we'll start with remarks from each person, and then we will open this up for questions. So why don't we go in exactly the order I introduced everybody, Catalina, Minu, and Kersey. Sure, Sunshine, thank you so much for uh, pulling this panel together. I'm as eager to hear and to learn from Manu and Kersey as everyone else here. Um, and so uh, first I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional land of the Narragansett Nation in Rhode Island, as many of you may. Um, I'm thankful for their contributions and stewardship of this land since time immemorial and for their perseverance in our communities today despite widespread historic territorial appropriation and genocide, I am thankful for their presence. And I'd also like to acknowledge that Southern Rhode Island where I live and where some of you also may live uh, was the site of the largest African slave holdings in New England. And it's not possible to decouple the two as records indicate African and indigenous captives in this region on appropriated land. So to begin, um, in terms of the project management conversation, um, I've managed a variety of projects in my nearly 20 years with NOAA, as Sunshine indicated, from small individual assignments to large federal grants, um, which would be very different, right, to some highly visible research expeditions. And I've been considering what might be most useful to share here, as the experiences really differed considerably, depending on whether the project was something I was solely responsible for or whether I was working within a team, among other things. The, the essential components like keeping within time, scope, budget, they're all obvious and ubiquitous regardless of project type. But I think there are definitely some more nuanced and equally important aspects of successful project management that aren't often discussed. And so as I thought about it over the past few weeks, um, I started to consider the various multicultural and multi-generational challenges that I've experienced over the years, especially as they relate to gender and cultural differences, as well as verbal and nonverbal communication norms and styles. It's all pretty interesting when I think back on it all, but what really jumped out as a top contender for me were the challenges associated with my intersectional identities and background, right? 
of being a Latina, of coming from basically an urban poor background and then working my way up into this very economically privileged and deeply ingrained white male majority culture within ocean science and within NOAA. You know, double standards, stereotypes, they, they prevail still, right? And we've, we've made some progress, but it's, it's been challenging. And there are particular dominant characteristics, values, behaviors, and perspectives that are normalized as unstated credentials of power and authority and success. And I didn't fit into any of those preconceived notions and ideas, and I still don't. <laughs> and this has played out differently over the years. And, <clears throat> but it was certainly exacerbated, excuse me, <clears throat> in situations where I also didn't have formal positional authority, right? which is really common with project management. You're often in a position where you have a great deal of responsibility, but no formal authority. And power and authority, they're really experienced in the context of our interpersonal relationships, organizational culture, role-based expectations and norms. So when you're managing a project from a really formal position of authority, your, your power to control things like inputs, outputs, um, timelines and resources, and to lead within a team, they're usually acknowledged and understood. It, you're, you're legitimized in your ability to influence others, right? But when you're leading a project without acknowledged and legitimized positional authority, you have to rely on other things, like your personal powers of influence, right? Your knowledge and skills and creativity and trust because relationships matter your social capital, what and who you know or are associated with, your proximity to leadership and power structures within the organization. And you often have limited control over the resources, but all of this rolls into your ability to motivate others. And other factors are always at play, but learning to lead this way more through influence rather than positionality has been important for me throughout my career. And full disclosure, I've done this to varying degrees of success. So oscillating between these higher and lower power dynamics and situations can be exhausting and it's complicated, especially when you're working within a multicultural environment and when you don't represent the dominant culture. And this can lead to stress and various levels of conflict and confusion. So I'll offer some suggestions and maybe a little bit of guidance. So first, unfortunately, most of us do this work without any formal training. So my first suggestion is to begin there. And because you're all here today, I assume you're on that track, which is important. Seek out project management training that includes developing those personal internal powers of leading within a low authority environment, developing cultural humility and embracing multi multicultural group dynamics. It's so important. Don't shy away from those DEI conversations, diversity, equity, inclusion, as well as access and justice, and specifically how they relate to valuing different ways of being and knowing and communicating in these multicultural spaces that we find ourselves in, and understand group norms and conflict management, right? And really learn to build community and find mentors and champions, coaches. There's a lot of unwritten rules out there. And you really have to build community to learn those, especially within particular cultures. Build out those competencies, you know, apply for stretch opportunities when you can, gain additional certifications as Metcalf is offering here. You will experience challenges, no doubt we all do, but remember every experience and every challenge is an opportunity to dispel stereotypes and dismantle those preconceived notions of what you can do and where you belong. And if you end up in a situation like me where you, you have a hard time finding that sense of belonging within your workspace, I encourage you to do what you can to help shape the organizational culture to become a place where you feel you belong, knowing that you're helping pave the way for others. You're clearly all in a place of greatness, although you may not see yourself represented in spaces and places you want to get to, you want to achieve, don't limit your vision of who you can become or where you belong based on what you see around you today. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catalina. That's an excellent start to this conversation. Um, Minu. 
Oh, thank you, Catalina. I'm learning a lot. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the kind uh, introduction, Sunshine. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and um, as I'm much newer to the project management, I just had like a few years experience, about around two years. I want to talk a little bit about how I got into this position uh, from like inter-level and uh, then some of the challenges I faced initially and how I managed to navigate my way through those challenges. So I had the opportunity to work as a, a scientist intern in a startup company, gel format uh, when I was doing my graduate studies um, through an NSF fellowship. And then uh, I really enjoyed uh, working at that company, I learned a lot. And at the time of graduation, I reached back to them and I asked, do you have a position available for me? They didn't have a scientist position available to them, but they had a project manager, manager position. And in a startup company, it's much more of the project manager in general, like a title of project manager can be vague and it's like a wide, <laughs> it can, uh, it has like kind of a vague definition. Uh, you can have wide, different responsibilities and it's much uh, more vague in a startup environment uh, just because everyone in a startup uh, would wear multiple hats and you're as then you're expected to do many different things and so it can be even a little more challenging and uh, what um, that was kind of the first challenge I faced and uh, the way to address it was to talk to the manager, my, this, which was the CEO of the company to see, okay, what are my responsibilities? Clarifying those and uh, being able to kind of have more defined expectations and uh, be able to and learn the different projects because there, are, and this is somewhere the project manager, especially, especially project management roles, I think would need a lot of team uh, work and you really need to be able to work with different people. I was assigned as some projects that I led and some projects that I'd only uh, manage a timeline for, uh, but uh, in any of those, uh, the most important aspects are to uh, be able to clearly communicate, uh, to align everyone, and uh, these are the things that you would think, okay, yeah, that's simple. That's something that uh, they're, they're obvious. They seem obvious and they seem simple, but in reality, it's not as simple, especially when that projects are between the different organizations. We had uh, projects with the different uh, NSF, NIH, different organizations, as well as uh, industry and be able to communicate with each of those uh, people and understanding what their needs are, what their expectations are, and then uh, aligning those with your organization's uh, expectations and uh, goals uh, can be challenging, but that's kind of the first thing that you need to uh, learn. And as uh, Catalina also mentioned, it's hard to find training uh, or mentors in this space, uh, but, uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, I've noticed that there are a lot of entry-level project management uh, positions, especially for the ones who are graduating and uh, think they're interested. Uh, I think those are very great experiences. I want to touch base on another thing because I just uh, recently switched my job when I was interviewing for the different jobs. Everyone collectively appreciated the uh, experience I had from this project management role. So everyone knows that project management is challenging and if you accomplish that if you be able to get a project management uh, position and succeed there at different levels it also helps you to uh, develop your career further even if you are interested if you just want to have the experience similar to what i wanted i had the experience and then i wanted to continue like in the scientific track uh, so it's um it's definitely a great opportunity. So I uh, encourage you to look into those inter-level project management uh, positions as you are looking for different jobs. Uh, so the other point I wanted to make was, it was, I work in a medical device startup, uh, which um, is different, I think, uh, in many aspects, because in healthcare in general, it's, it can be complicated. You 
need to talk to surgeons, uh, which might use terminologies that you have no idea what they're talking about, and uh, being able to kind of simplify, talk to different types of people. And uh, that's another thing which I think helped me a lot and was important to succeed. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention was about the many different softwares which are available uh, to uh, build this project management uh, experience. Uh, uh, the ones I worked with are Trello, Board, and Monday.com, uh, the uh, projects from Microsoft. Uh, those softwares uh, have many different capabilities, many of them, the Trello and Monday.com do have free versions. So even if you're interested to just get your hands on something and just, I don't know, manage your own uh, tasks uh, using one of these softwares to get a sense of, okay, what it is, what does it look like? Uh, I think that uh, can give you a little sense of what project management would be uh, when you're in a position like that. So I'll stop there and... Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Minou. I really appreciate all those very specific recommendations. Um, and Kersey, please share your thoughts. Um, so to follow up, uh, I think when I was first asked about this topic, you know, the thing that stood out to me from the various experiences I have um, managing projects, both at the academic level government and in private business is that so much of it revolves around um, navigating the complexities of managing people. And so I really wanted to uh, share or, or touch on uh, how important it is to really understand and recognize that project management, in addition to just kind of keeping track of, of the move, all the moving pieces, oftentimes comes down to the interactions that you have with people. And this is both motivating them to get their work done, um, serving as like a check or balance when they're, they're struggling to do things to the standard that you require. And even, um, even I would say like advocating for yourself within a project manager role for someone who say like is over you and maybe is um, potentially presenting or putting forth on you like limitations on what your capabilities are. You know, even having to manage expectations or perceptions about your capabilities. And so, so much of it, when I, when I look back and reflect, is this interplay and interaction of people management? And I think what's really important is recognizing that at a very um, kind of base level, you know, understanding or managing people, sorry, managing people really requires you to understand and listen to them. So if you're asking someone to do something, you, you know, what you don't want to do is fall into this, the trap, uh, projecting on what it is that they can do or what it is that they uh, can't do. And so it's really important to be really clear about the expectations, ensuring that like whatever those expectations are, that the person has received them. You know, one of the, the tricks that I always use is I follow up any sort of verbal conversation or meeting with a follow-up summary email. So there's no ambiguity about what was asked and who was assigned what, because what you'll find is uh, some people just will, will forget things. Some people may have more nefarious means about why they forget things, but you know, really having, you know, I had to learn really the hard way from having um, met, uh, interactions with people that it's really important to have, as they say, you know, have things written down so that it's, it's kind of indisputable about what the expectations are and about what level of communication um, was, uh, was that occurred. And so that, that'll be really clear to you if you've not done a good job of communicating something or someone hasn't received your message well, when you write it down and they say, oh, is that what you meant? Because I was thinking this. And so that just really helps shore up any sort of uh, confusion around delegation uh, or dissemination of information. Um, the reason I said delegation is because the other aspect of project management I think is really important is how you delegate the people, which involves the, the communication role. You know, coming out of academia and being trained classically as a, a academic scientist, you really are kind of shaped into this mold of being a one-stop shop, you know, the, can, the all can do uh, individual. And as you ascend from the kind of graduate school role into uh, any sort of uh, environment professionally, even, the, even within academia, it's impossible to have the level of success and to do the amount of work that's required of you if you aren't delegating that work off. And it becomes really difficult to shift that mindset because you're so, um, it can be easy to like be so over consuming that like you have to essentially hand off trust 
in addition to handing off the work that, that someone's going to do it to the level that you yourself might do it. And it, it is really important because at a, at, a, at a point where you're managing, let's say, multiple projects or even multiple people, uh, you know, you can't get the project, collect the data, analyze the data, interpret the data, you know, write it all up. You can't, you can't do all the pieces. It's just, it's, a, it's an impossibility. So delegation is really important. And then in, when you're doing that delegation and, and determining and, and being aware of like, oh, this is something I should be handing off to, to so-and-so, that then allows you or requires you to have that uh, aspect of what I talked about before, which is that communication, learning how to really understand it and motivate and interact with people. So you're handing off the information, you're having the meetings, you're setting the expectations, you're following up with, with the people. Which then brings me to the third point, which is that, and this is an inevit inevitability, as part of project management, we're dealing with people, there are gonna be situations where uh, there's conflict, disagreements, and you have to become really, it's become comfortable having uncomfortable conversations is the way that I like to describe it. You know, essentially, you know, don't don't go the passive aggressive route. No, don't, don't be upset that someone hasn't met your level of expectation or didn't do something on time and then that <clears throat> reflects badly on you. And then you you don't ever actually address it with them. You kind of just, um, you know, you, you, you behave in a passive aggressive way because you're feeling um, like you haven't expressed how you truly feel. I think it's really important to sit down with someone and be direct and say, you know, this is the expectation that I had. This is what happened. And again, this is why it's really important to have these things written down because if you've communicated with someone and there's a actual written communication that they've responded back to, when you get into those meetings where you're saying, you know, I don't think you met the standard that we discussed, they can't hem and haw about like um, what was said and their interpretation of what was said because you follow that up with uh, validation on what exactly you expected. And so I do think it's really important to to have those types of conversations and communication, they, they don't ever become uncomfortable or not uncomfortable. Um, you just become more comfortable in that uncomfort, if that makes any sense. And I think that's really important, both in terms of project management, which in order to do successfully, I think you have to do people management and you're not gonna be able to get away from that within the project management role. And that I think also holds true for um, really making sure that you are ensuring that other people aren't projecting on you what your capabilities are. And this, I'm thinking of you guys being mostly junior, getting ready to uh, ascend out of school into the more professional workspace. You know, there can be at times this perception that, you, you know, with your, say, like age, your capabilities are X or Y, right? And that might be true, but also might not be true, right? And so I think it's also, it's really important that you're communicating clearly what your level of, of um, capabilities are and don't let other people pigeonhole you into roles and responsibilities that they think you can do if you feel like you have the capability to do more. You know, it's, it's really important to be defining for yourself what it is that you can and do and then communicating that to those who are making those decisions. So I think there's gonna be a lively discussion around all of this, but those are just kind of the general three themes that I always think about when it comes to project management that I have really kind of interconnected all of the various um, work fields that I've been in. Thank you, Kersey. Um, and thanks to all of you. This is an incredible starting point for this conversation. And um, so everyone, please feel free to start um, either raising your hand and asking questions, or you can drop questions in the chat. And we'll stop recording now. Um,